Welcome to the next episode of Debt Talks, the series by the Private Debt Initiative of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm Moritz Schillerich, fellow of Vinet, and hosting these events. Today, we uh, will talk about developing country debt, and we again have a dream team together. Amazing uh, combination. We have Sarah Jane Clifton, director at the Jubilee Debt Campaign, a UK-based charity. We have Philippa Ziegel-Glöckner, founder of Dezernat Zukunft in Berlin, and uh, formerly with uh, the German Finance Ministry, and Mieter Gulati, professor of law at Duke University and a great expert in developing country sovereign debt questions. So what we want to understand today is, uh, I think as an overarching question, how the debt situation in developing countries that has been a concern for a long time has become, has shifted, has become worse and has become uh, very structurally different with the pandemic. So we want to understand how the long-term structural questions of over-indebtedness, debt relief, uh, interact, if you will, with the new challenges coming from the uh, corona pandemic. Um, and we want to discuss big ideas. We want to understand the debt situation in developing countries and emerging economies. We want to understand the policy response and ask where it falls short, where we should um, where we should uh, come up with new initiatives or, re or change what has been done so far. We want to understand how COVID fits into the bigger picture, um, um, also with regard to private external debt, and uh, also what should be what the role possibly of China and bilateral official creditors will be. Uh, along the way, we want to talk about if debt is a millstone around growth. Uh, when we think about the recovery next year, we want to understand how the vaccine changes the outlook and maybe ask from a macroeconomic point of view as well, how we should think about debt relief as a, an expansionary policy. Let me start with uh, giving the floor, if you will, to uh, me to and ask me to, to give us the broader picture, outline the big questions for us and how you see them, me to what has been done, what is it that the G20 joint framework has achieved, um, and where do we go from here? So help, help us think through uh, the big picture. All right, that, that's a big question, Moritz. Uh, thank you for including me. And I'll try to give you my simplistic understanding of the big picture. But let me give you a caveat. I am a law professor, which means, uh, by definition, I look at the small picture. I, I had the misfortune of spending some years in graduate school in economics, and I was often told to look at the big picture. And at some point, I realized... I wasn't any good at it, so I left. Uh, and my professors told me, don't get buried in the weeds. And that's kind of all I was good at. So with that uh, caveat, here's how I see the picture. And to me, it, it's quite bleak. Much of the developing world, and particularly the emerging market world that borrows from the private markets and we're focused on private debt, uh, was on the brink of, or clearly so, um, over-indebted before the COVID crisis hit. But the markets were funding the emerging markets, and so this was a problem that we could worry about, but did not need immediate solutions. Plus, we thought when there are defaults, and in 2020, as a result of pre-COVID misbehavior by some of these governments, we've sovereign defaults, which is more than I can remember in the last 30 years in any given year. So we were already in bad shape. But our assumption had been we would have sovereign defaults occur one by one, and we had techniques to deal with them one by one. Not the most efficient techniques, but we had techniques uh, that had been worked out, uh, the IMF, the uh, European authorities, uh, academic scholars who work on this. We, we had been working the last decade or so on these techniques, but we had and have no technique to deal with the kind of situation where 
dozens of countries go into crisis at the same time. We just have not put anything in place. And I fear that the two effects, the two big effects of the COVID-19 pandemic of A, lowering growth rates dramatically in much of the developing world, and B, increasing debt stocks dramatically in many of these countries are going to result in the next six to 12 months in a dozen plus countries going into a default type scenario. And we just have no mechanism to deal with that. And if you have no mechanism, that's a recipe for disaster. So th that's my pessimistic view. Uh, I think an optimist might say, well, you know, the markets are continuing to fund anybody who wants at incredibly low rates. So uh, you're just uh, unreasonably pessimistic. But that's where I would start. Right. Fantastic. Dara, let me come to you and, and ask you how the pandemic has changed your work um, with the the debt, um, the Jubilee debt campaign, and how does he, how do you see the situation from on the ground, from um, yeah, your experience and your work in that field? Thanks, Rich. Thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Um, I guess I would start by saying we um, very much share uh, Miti's view about the situation being a dire one. Um, our view is that the, the debt situation in the global south is very serious indeed. Um, for perhaps for your viewers who uh, don't have such a, a grounding in these issues, um, a debt crisis was already spreading across the global south before COVID-19. Um, we saw a big reduction in the indebtedness of developing countries and their debt servicing um, in the first decade of this century in response to um, a big round of debt cancellation that happened in response to the previous crisis. The debt crisis which hit countries in the in the 80s and 90s, um, but unfortunately, the West's response to the 2008 crash um, uh, led to a big uh, lending boom to developing countries. So we saw uh, loans to developing countries on the rise pretty much from 2011. Um, countries also hit by a commodity price crash in 2014, um, and so what all of this meant was that basically. Pretty much since 2011, we've seen rising debt levels, rising debt servicing in developing countries. Um, and we were already worried about this before COVID hit. We published some research just before um, COVID hit in January, uh, showing that already there were 64 uh, developing countries that were spending more on their debt payments than on healthcare. So we already had a big crisis before the pandemic really hit. And then, of course, the pandemic has um, uh, essentially it's dramatically accelerated and deepened uh, this debt crisis, which was on the horizon. Um, of course, the pandemic has um, hit all countries' uh, economies very badly. Um, but for developing countries, they've had particular problems. They've obviously not only had to lock down their, their economies in the way that richer countries have, they have suffered another commodity price crash. Many have suffered a collapse in tourism. Many have suffered a collapse in remittances. We've seen the biggest capital outflow um, from developing countries ever recorded. And because their economies aren't trusted in the way that richer economies are, they haven't had the same tools available um, as richer countries to um, survive the crisis in the way that we have. So uh, borrowing at ultra low interest rates, for example, or being able to do massive quantitative easing. Um, so so uh, as Mitu said, it has pushed a lot of countries now very, very close to the brink. Um, and in terms of the, the policy response, um, the IMF and the G20, um, uh, the sort of self-appointed group of um, most powerful countries in the world, they we'd say they should be commended for acting swiftly. Um, but unfortunately, the response has been very, very far from 
adequate. So the IMF has cancelled some debt that was owed to it, um, about 500 million by around um, 29 of the poorest countries, and has also issued a lot of emergency finance to developing countries. And the G20 in April created this scheme, um, uh, the DSSI, um, which offered to suspend the debt payments owed to the G20 for around 73 countries. Um, and at the same time, they called on private lenders to voluntary, voluntarily um, uh, mirror that kind of suspension. Um, like I said, that, that it was commendable that they, they acted swiftly, but there are some incredibly significant weaknesses and problems with those initiatives. The biggest issue with the G20 scheme is that it's suspending debt payments. It's not cancelling them. So really, it's just kicking the can down the road for a much bigger crisis in a couple of years' time when there's debt payments come due. Um, also, countries have to ask for the suspension. It's not automatic. And there's been a lot of scaremongering about access to private markets, which has disincentivized countries that need it from asking for the suspension. Um, and the other really big problem um, is that it only covers the debt payments that are owed to the G20. It doesn't cover debt payments owed to the multilateral institutions, the IMF and World Bank. Uh, but from our point of view, the, the biggest problem of all is it doesn't cover the debts owed to private lenders, um, and uh, which basically means that all of this uh, debt relief and action that we've seen from the IMF and, and G20 um, ha has effectively been used to kind of bail out private lenders who've lent at very high interest rates to developing countries. Um, and developing countries are still servicing those debts to, to private lenders um, as we speak. So the headlines from our point of view is that um, we need we need debt cancellation. If we are to avert um, uh, a whole series of incredibly messy and destructive debt defaults, we need debt cancellation for countries. Um, uh, the, the, currently, the global debt movement is calling for cancellation of external pay debt payments for all countries that need it um, until at least the end of 2021. But we also need um, a multilateral mechanism, as, as Me Too um, referred to, uh, that enables an, an orderly um, resolution of these debt crises um, so that the, the debts can be cancelled down to a sustainable level. Otherwise, this crisis is just going to spiral further and further out of control. It will be even harder and more expensive to resolve it. And critically, it will eat more and more into public funds that developing countries desperately need in order to um, make progress on the sustainable development goals. Thanks. Great. Right, thank you, Sarah. Um, Philippa, you're in a unique position here in the sense that not only have you worked, uh, I think, a while ago in the uh, financial minister, in the finance ministry of a developing country, uh, but you've also been um, on the creditor side and have gained some um, first-hand insights into the discussions going on in uh, on the other side of the table, if you will, in the G20. So maybe tell us about your take on the situation. What are the constraints? What are the what are people in the room thinking? How we solve this situation going forward? Thank you very much for for having me. I mean, this has already been really really interesting hearing from Sarah and me too. Um, I mean, maybe let's take a step back even and think about the bigger situation at the moment. Um, because, I mean, when you work in the finance ministry in a developed country, you also, ha you also have a lot of <laughs> issues on your table at the moment right now. And I think this may have even been the biggest problem for us, a real capacity constraint. It may sound stupid, but at the moment, if you're a finance ministry, you are in completely unknown territory given your own economy. Um, I mean, Germany has issued as much debt in a single month as never before. Um, we shut down our own complete economy. We came up with programs that, you know, I mean, we had literally dreamt up in three days and we'd never done, done before. Um, so even trying to kind of understand what's going on and, and making space um, to think about this hugely complicated issue is already a problem. Um, and the situation is so complex that even for people who work on it the whole time, you know, who do nothing else, I mean, Sarah works on this full time, 
Um, it's very, very complex, very hard to understand what's actually going on in developing countries. And I think you then have diverging trends because countries that can go to markets and kind of look fine have been doing okay. I mean, Peru just issued a 100-year bond. Um, and then on the other hand, especially low-income countries, uh, you have really tight liquidity constraints that prevent them from you know, having the most urgent funds. So even trying to understand that and trying to understand the scale of the problem and getting a proper picture is quite tricky in times where you work seven days a week, 24 hours to kind of keep your own economy going. Um, and then, I mean, when you zoom in a little bit and you think about, okay, what, you know, what's the calculus in, in the head of a, one of the rich countries that, that lends a lot of money? Um, I think one of the first issues is actually what Mitu mentioned. What we always love is when there's a given mechanism, because obviously you want to do something. Um, you want to look good. You also think it's right. And if there's a given mechanism, it's very easy, you know, you can just kind of step in, like, do your thing, look good, walk out, and that's it. While it's a lot more complicated when there isn't a template. Because then, especially when you're a big country, you always look around, what are G7 doing, what are G20 doing, and it becomes a very tactical game. Uh, because, you know, you think about precedent. Um, Obviously, you know, when you do one thing once, you're going to be asked to do it again. So then you look at total cost um, at a time where you're spending a lot of money in your own economy. Um, that is a thing that worries you. Um, so it, it, the calculus just gets a lot more complicated. And then, you know, you basically get into the 20 negotiations that you now have to do virtually. So you can't really have good kind of discussions where you sort out stuff quickly in a one on one. So it all gets a lot more complicated. And I think the absence of a pre-existing, well-functioning mechanism for this kind of situation is really um, what, what a lot of people found very, very tricky. And then obviously, you have the long-standing elephants in the room. Um, so when you are a donor from a big country, then you're always looking for one donor from one of the emerging markets. Um, and you spend a lot of time trying to get that donor to buy into the Paris Club. Um, and to work with us together, um, maybe for those of you who aren't so familiar, um, I'm talking about China. In, in governments, I guess you prefer not to mention that name, but I think it's obvious maybe once you spell it out. Um, but so everybody's been working for a long time to kind of get China into the Paris Club to, to agree on, on the mechanisms that we've established. Um, and now you obviously worry that when you do something unilaterally, um, and they are not on board, um, and they are a big, they're a big creditor, um, that, that may set a precedent that's not good. And, and the second thing is, and I think Sarah mentioned it, is obviously private creditors. What you don't want to do as a government, um, and where you're also very worried about, I guess, public perception is, um, we giving funds that then just cross subsidize private um, private donors. That's quite a big problem. So you start to worry about all these things. There's not a pre existing mechanism, and actually you spend twelve hours a day trying to keep your own economy afloat. Um, I think that's explaining a bit of what's going on. And then what really is the last concern, and that always bugged me, kind of thinking about my prior job um, in the Liberian Ministry of Finance kind of the last thing you think about is liquidity. So how do these countries get cash fast? Um, when I now switch hats and I think about a very poor country that borrows in foreign currency and has a sudden crisis, really the first thing and actually kind of the only thing you think about is cash. You just need money right now because, I mean, in Liberia, I think we had about a month um, of, of cash in our accounts. Um, and when that ran out or taxes fell short or the economy had some other kind of cool down, we had teachers banging on the doors of the ministry because we couldn't pay them. Um, so all these international mechanisms and initiatives are far too slow. And when Western donors come in and tell you, you have to do X, Y, Z in three months, we come back, you think, well, we're broke by then. Um, so, 
that's really what your priority is. And then what do you prioritize in your own negotiations? You prioritize your negotiations with China. Um, because when it comes to debt structuring and <laughs> debt forgiveness, they are a lot more flexible. Um, you, it's, it's very hard to kind of get official term sheets and to get it all as kind of officially agreed as with Western donors. You never know what happens and you may have to pay a higher price, but they are very quick. Um, and maybe you have to give them, I don't know, some mine or whatever, but you don't really care because you just need cash to keep the country alive. The second thing is Western donors are very, very hard to understand because they have all these different things going on in the head that I just tried to explain from kind of the other side of the table. You sometimes in negotiations really don't know what they want. Um, and again, with the Chinese, it's a lot more straightforward. Um, when you then think about private creditors, especially, I guess, when you come from a low-income country, you're really just scared. So there is this whole story today that we actually think, well, maybe there's not so much reason for countries to be scared of private donors or of defaulting because what we've seen in the past is they can get money from the markets quite well afterwards again. Um, it looks a lot scarier from the other side because you don't have all the fancy lawyers. Um, you don't really have all the knowledge in the background. So from private creditors, I think you're just basically trying to hide or run away. Um, one of the most most powerful initiatives I've seen there to address this, even if it's on a much smaller scale than big debt relief, is something like the International Lawyer Scheme, um, where you get very experienced lawyers from the UK or the US who know the legal regimes to work for the government and, and help try and resolve um, legal cases. Um, so I think it looks quite different from a former poor country's perspective. I guess in the end, you care about debt relief, but really the, the first thing we all cared about was, was getting cash fast. And what we really struggled with is that the other side of the table didn't really understand this and couldn't even give us predictability as to when funds were coming in. Um, and I guess that's what I would wonder about now. Um, I mean, you just have suspension of interest rate payments anyway, so it's much smaller. Uh, maybe I should maybe let yeah, maybe let me come in and, and, and pick up where you left. And also there is one um, um, grave mistake I made. I should have said at the beginning, um, we have a Q&A function. It's already been very active and I will weave in these questions. I keep an eye on them, weave them into the discussion. So please feel free to um, ask us questions uh, along the way. Um, I thought, Philippa, what you said about like, and, and, and me too and Sarah, there's, there's one question which is like, what do we... There is a, we don't have a mechanism to deal with this problem. It is also unprecedented in its, as as we as we said in sort of its its uh, synchronicity that a lot of countries are in in difficult situations at the same time. If we the the four of us with the the INET audience um, all around the world were to devise that mechanism in this situation, what do we want from it? I guess we want to sort out the over-indebted countries from those who just need a liquidity, so from those those who need a real restructuring, from those who are okay with liquidity relief. Um, but we also want that mechanism to have some kind of burden sharing between private and public creditors. Um, me too. Help me design that mechanism. You're the lawyer. <laughs> so I think um, we have to think of it in uh, two phases. Uh, first, l let me just see. Uh, say, uh, I mean, I've already learned an immense amount from Sarah and Philippa. I mean, that was. Uh, I I'm going to play this recording for my students. Uh, I learned a, a lot, and I've been working in this business for over two decades. But I don't think that we can design sort of the optimal ex ante mechanism. I mean that that elephant has left uh, the the um the home and you know you you sort of now we have to think in terms of ex post solutions. And as a practical matter, I think what we need now is a mechanism uh to allow us to design a mechanism. So if we have let's say a dozen big defaults 
or countries on the brink of default. We don't want uh, creditors uh, all over the world suing all of these countries in every jurisdiction that they can find. We have to put in place some kind of mechanism that stops uh, this uncoordinated uh, potential litigation so that the experts from, you know, the finance ministries, uh, the fund, the bank, uh, no matter what our uh, critiques of them may be, that they have time uh, to put something in place. And uh, Philippa was very diplomatic in uh, talking about uh, Germany and, you know, how you have a domestic crisis to deal with. But uh, from my perspective in the U.S., um, I feel like, you know, the Germans, uh, and I was part of, you know, criticizing them during the European crisis, sovereign debt crisis in Greece, but they've been at the table trying to help all through. But I am afraid that institutions like uh, the U.S. Treasury that I have I had always found were front and center in trying to help, even if I didn't always like their views, they've disappeared. And uh, they've disappeared because they have, A, a big domestic crisis, and B, because the U.S. has unfortunately taken a very nationalist turn. Um, and uh, I think we desperately need them to be back in the table, and the same uh, with the U.K. I mean, in the past, we needed expertise to solve these kinds of problems. And as Sarah pointed out, we potentially have the kind of problem facing us that we have never dealt with. Uh, maybe there are still some people around who remember how they dealt with the Latin American debt crisis of the 80s, uh, whose wisdom we can use. But I think in terms of a mechanism, we need a mechanism to buy us time uh, for a mechanism to be designed uh, uh, you know, we're not going to have sovereign bankruptcy. It's just not going to happen now, and it's too late. We need something much more temporary. And when I think the people who have done something closest to this in recent years uh, are the experts in the EU. They put in place a mechanism uh, for the entire uh, EU area uh, very quickly after the sovereign debt crisis. Now, maybe it's not optimal, but at least they have thought about this on a bigger scale than anybody else. But uh, as Philippa said, there's not that many of those people. Um, and the scale of this potential crisis is, uh, you know, it, it is many times larger. So uh, I want a mechanism for the mechanism. But I don't know what it is. Uh, can I come in? Um, uh, so I think on this, first of all, it's really important to recognise that um, uh, some various developing countries, most, mostly led by Argentina, but with a lot of other developing countries involved, have been trying to put in place a mechanism for uh, the last decade or more, um, uh, Argentina has led discussions in the UN for a sovereign debt workout mechanism. Um, and those discussions have advanced quite far, but have been systematically blocked by, um, uh, as Mitu indicated, the UK and the US, the two countries with the biggest finance sectors, the biggest constituencies of private lenders, and obviously the biggest vested interest in preventing um, uh, a fair process for fair bankruptcy process for countries um, that basically, you know, uh, the UK and the US, have, we've got a vested interest in, in perpetuating this enormous power imbalance which exists between private lenders and developing countries. So that process, um, is, well, not just one process, uh, various processes in the UN have been systematically blocked by the US and UK. It got as far as um, agreement on some principles for sovereign debt restructuring, which I'd recommend people Google, um, which set out some of the most important aspects of, of um, what a sovereign debt restructuring process should look like. I think the UK and US abstained on that vote, um, and it's not legally binding. Um, 
But I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, this moment has been anticipated and some developing countries did try to fix the roof while the sun was shining. And it was the richer countries that are responsible for preventing that and for the mess that we're now in. Um, the, the, uh, I agree, it would be very hard to construct quick enough the kind of system that's needed in terms of a really proper sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. Um, having said that, it, it is something that we need the international community to get started on as quickly as possible. We, with allies in the global debt movement, believe it's possible to build on what's there in terms of the um, uh, the DSSI or what it's evolving into um, to to adequately deal with this what what needs to happen is um uh rich countries need to take responsibility for uh, first being open to debt cancellation so currently the initiative is very ambiguous on debt cancellation um uh the, the first step is obviously you know being willing to recognize that debt cancellation is needed um and but then secondly for rich countries to take responsibility for their private creditors. And there's lots of ways for that to be enforced. So Me Too talked about legislation. 90% um, of the of the private debts, uh, the, the, the debts owed to private lenders by developing countries are owed either under uh, English law or New York, New York law. So actually, um, relatively easily, you could put in place some legal protections in those two jurisdictions, which would enforce um, the DSSI or what comes after it and protect uh, developing countries from um, pernicious legal action by private creditors um, and enforce uh, uh, debt cancellation agreements, which, which are agreed multilaterally. Um, there are other ways as well. For example, the IMF um, and the G20 can require comparable treatment for private creditors if they engage in any uh, debt restructuring negotiations with countries. So if they offer debt cancellation to a country, they can say, uh, you can have this cancellation of our bilateral debt so long as there's comparable treatment for private lenders. So there's lots of ways to do it rapidly. Um, the thing that I would say is very important in all of this from a debt justice perspective is what is defined as sustainable debt. So currently, the IMF, um, the IMF de definition is about whether or not a country is at risk of default. Um, but we don't think that that um, that line in the sand is is what's important in relation to sustainable debt. What matters is whether your country um, has enough money to be able to um, deliver on the basic economic and social rights of citizens. Can you keep the lights on? Can you keep the hospitals running? Can you keep your basic poverty alleviation initiatives running? Um, as Philip has said, uh, when Liberia you know has a month's worth um, of money left in the bank account, that you can't run an effective government advancing towards a sustainable development goals in that situation, we think it's really critical that we agree a definition of debt sustainability that looks at those wider um, obligations in relation to human rights. Could I come in there? Um, Sarah, really interesting what you said. And um, I mean, one thing I wonder about, you said, and I think that's true and acknowledged by probably everybody kind of, um, this isn't completely surprising. Like, we kind of have seen the debt build up over the years. Um, this has been an ongoing discussion, as Me Too said. I mean, for a long time, there were discussions about a bankruptcy regime that then didn't happen and so forth. Um, question for me is, and maybe this is also why I'm a bit pessimistic on this topic, is why hasn't it happened? Um, why wasn't there progress in, in good times? Um, and for me, one of the first questions here really is, What's the goal of this? Do we agree on the goal of this, um, of debt relief? Uh, you spelled it out, what the goal could, uh, could look like and probably should look like. Um, are countries able to deliver on basic services? Um, but I'm not sure that is actually the implicit agreement, um, especially not when it comes to putting money and interests on the table. Um, yeah, maybe I've become pessimistic on international development, um, seeing it um, from kind of the inside of the Liberian government. But my conclusion has been that international development is really about keeping the system going and, and preventing fallout and conflict and breakdown, because this is literally what you see there. Like International donors will never allow that country to collapse, probably not also to kind of be controlled by countries they don't like. 
but that's really how, about how far it goes. Um, you don't really go much further. And I think as long as you have that, um, that speaks exactly to you're only going to fix the roof when the country is really bankrupt, when it can't pay its bills anymore, and you're only going to really fix as much as you need to. So I think agreeing on a goal is really the first thing. And then that comes back to Mitu's, um comment about finding a mechanism to find a mechanism. <laughs> we really need to set that frame to come together and, and decide what we want and then take it from there. Um, I'm too young to have witnessed the discussions around the big debt relief in the 90s, um, which I guess both of you kind of know the process. So I'd be really interested in what you thought drove the momentum there and made that happen. Maybe do you want to reply to that? So, um, Sarah mentioned legislation, and Sarah is exactly right. That sort of if you're thinking about the emerging market and uh, developing world, almost all of their market-based borrowing is in the London and New York markets, and under contracts that are governed by New York and English law. So that means that those two countries can, in effect, just by coordinating between the two of them, put in place uh, protections. Now, th that sounds uh, efficient, possibly quick. It's not going to happen. It, they're not going to do it. It's just, I mean, it, U.S. Congress, it, I mean, they can't even protect the domestic economy. Uh, they are not investing resources to help the rest of the world now. So we have to think of other solutions. So the model for me, and this is just uh, out of desperation because I can't think of anything else, is um, not as far back as the 90s, uh, but a decade and a half ago, uh, which is Iraq. In, in it, for Iraq in 2004, the global community, meaning every member of the United Nations Security Council, decided to cooperate. I, I mean, I realize that today this is astonishing, uh, but, you know, the G20 uh, has cooperated. They decided to put in place a global immunity shield for Iraqi oil assets in order to enable Iraq to recover. Now, it's been done once. It can be done again, uh, but you need whatever magic uh, happened then. And I only worked on it at the margins. I, I was a very uh, irrelevant, marginal uh, player, and I didn't actually work on the immunity shield. Uh, but it can be done. And there are people who, who figured out how to get Russia and China and the U.S. and the U.K. and, you know, all the members of the Security Council to cooperate, to put in place a four-year immunity shield. Uh, that is the only model I can think of uh, to deal with the kind of situation we might be facing. Now, maybe um, the markets will continue to fund and expand their funding, and uh, we won't need this, but I think we need to prepare for it. Uh, so there's got to be people at the German finance ministry who were actively involved in that uh, Iraqi solution because Germany had a lot of debts uh, that Iraq owed to it. And Germany basically said, you know, we're willing to fix this. France had it. Russia had it. Uh, they cooperated. Uh, and many of us don't know how, but they did do it once. So that's my that's what that's the model I would use to buy us time. If I could come in on that, I think maybe I'm slightly less um, pessimistic than me too on that. So there is actually precedence in the UK. Um, in, pen in 2010, we passed um, a law, the Debt Relief Developing Countries Act, um, which ju does just this, what we're talking about. It was to support the um, implementation of the, the last big rounds of multilateral debt relief, the heavily indebted poor countries initiative. 
Um, and what we, what, well, this is before my time, but what I have learned was, was happening um, was that some uh, 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 vulture funds that we call them, um, private lenders had bought up developing country debt um, when countries were in debt crisis, um, at, uh, when the debt was at rock bottom prices, and then were um, using the considerable uh, financial resources um, uh, that they had available to pursue those developing countries in courts around the world for full repayment on that debt. Um, and in order to prevent that from happening and in order to force those private creditors to comply with this important globally negotiated multilateral scheme, um, the UK, as one of these key jurisdictions, passed a law um, uh, enforcing um, There's an ugly sound. Is this only on my side? Maybe. Same here. Same um, here. Okay. I can still you think, hear you. you, can you that, maybe you we all. There was some, oh, some big creditor blocked Sarah yeah, from saying what she was going to say. I think so. <laughs> this is the power of the vulture funds. Um, okay. Um, yeah. I mean, is it, are we? Claire, are you on mute? Okay. Well, I mean, I still hear, still hear the sound. It's not very pleasant. Um, maybe we all mute ourselves and see if it goes away for a second. Okay. So that seems to have worked at least on my side. So there's some feedback somewhere. Um, while we're working on this, um, very um, interesting point there from from Sarah. And I also wanted to weave in the, the first questions here from the Q and A, which has been very active. Um, there, there is a there is a concern about, and, and I think Mito and, and Philippa, you also both mentioned it. Um, why don't we kickstart that mechanism to find a mechanism? Why don't we implement? Um, the debt is concentrated in London and New York or issued under, under these, in these two jurisdictions. What are the very, um, what are the obstacles? What are the very sort of concrete, um, obstacles to implementing such a, you know, standstill, um, um, arrangement that gives us time to sort this out? Um, I think you've all from different sides, um, learned about this is also a question that also came up here by uh, Christopher and Robert. And, and what's potentially the role that institutions like INED or other um, um, organizations can play in getting there? I'm going to unmute myself again. We, I hope we um, we got rid of that sound. Thank you. And Philippa, maybe you want to start? So oh, ha happy to. Um, even though me too can probably give a more substantive answer, but I'll, I'll try. I guess very pragmatically, um, what's, what's preventing us from, from moving right now is, um, <laughs> there needs to be someone who, who takes the lead, um, who goes in. Um, if you ask right now, I guess in Germany it's a bit hard because we have just about one year left until an election. Um, not sure that's a topic that, that you want to start um, one year before before then. Um, we are still in the middle of a crisis um, with everybody very, very busy on, on trying to, to do what's necessary um, here in the country. So I guess I, I think on both on, on the political side and on the working out what needs to be done side, someone who, who steps up is crucial. Um, I still see the, the IMF as a key institution there um, because they have the advantage of having both. They have a uh, political cloud. Uh, they know all the players around the table. Um, in terms of knowing where what debt lies, they probably have a good sense um, and they have the analytical firepower behind it. Um, so I would I put most faith into that, but maybe that's my bias coming from the multilateral system. I'm I'm a little bit less optimistic uh, based on what we've seen from the DSSI and uh, the common framework 
uh, where uh, both of um, both initiatives in which I'm sure the IMF played an active role that uh, they are going to give us something without the leadership of one of the big finance ministries. Uh, but, I, you know, this is my um, cynicism that they are a political body while having immense expertise uh they won't do anything major without political approval, and in particular, political approval from their largest shareholder. Uh, they People at the IMF still remember their attempt to put in place a sovereign debt uh, restructuring mechanism where the biggest supporter, the U.S., just cut them off at the knees. And uh, they don't want that to happen again. So I'm, I'm, I'm less optimistic. I, I mean, sorry, Philip, but I think that we're all looking to Germany. I mean, the U.S., I mean, we don't even have a, an administration. And the U.K., I, I think they're kind of worried uh, about other things. So uh, Mrs. Merkel is, uh, I'm kind of hoping she's once again steps up uh, to the plate uh, and while Sarah is right, the UK did pass that HIPAA legislation. I, I'm really not a big fan of its effects. I think it did squat. Um, it, the, in, I think it was designed to do nothing. Uh, but maybe I'm too cynical. But regardless, legislation's not going to happen in the US. It's just not. They, they, there is no way to get Congress to act uh, on that. So... Sarah, I think we can't hear you right now. Can you mute? No, still not. No, let me let me maybe. Like, it's the vulture funds. Trying. They got upset at Sarah. <laughs> the vulture funds got upset at Sarah. No, they now they knocked her off completely. Not uh, completely. Um, in, me too, in, like, in, in concrete terms, what's preventing Congress to act? Is that interest groups? Is that a general... Uh, like, yes, yes, interest groups. <laughs> interest groups are very powerful. The, I mean, interest groups are very powerful. And, uh, you know, the Congress is uh, right now under the control of the Republicans. So, I mean, the Senate is under the control of the Republicans. I mean, there is no appetite to do this for the rest of the world. So it's not even a question of votes. The, even the Democrats are not thinking about this. And there's nobody at Treasury to push them to do this. Uh, I think Janet Yellen, I mean, thank heavens that Janet Yellen is going to be the person. Uh, but I think she's busy with other stuff. Um, I realize the Germans are also busy with other stuff. Uh, but... Uh, I don't know. Maybe Mrs. Merkel can call Mr. Biden and the world can uh, turn around. But I, I think we need to use the expertise of the EU, not just Germany. Uh, they have the, been the ones who most recently dealt with a gargantuan sovereign debt crisis. At least they know what not to do. And, you know, they did kind of put Greece back on um, track, fingers crossed. Uh, we need to learn from that, even if we think lots of mistakes were made. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, okay, good. Um, just a couple of things to clarify. So we wouldn't actually need the US Congress to pass a law in relation to um, enforcing the debt restructuring. I think it's actually New York as a state um, that, that all of that is held under. I'm sure, though, that is um, subject to similar kind of vested interests as Congress in relation to that. Um, I also feel slightly uneasy disagreeing with, uh, on a legal question with a distinguished law professor. But from our perspective, the, the Debt Relief Developing Countries Act was effective. It was preventative. And there were no further cases of vulture funds um, developing countries. So 
And I think there has been some research looking at how much money developing countries have saved because of that. Um, but it is, but that also it's important to recognize that isn't the only mechanism. So the, the IMF itself actually has, um, rules set out already that say, um, it won't lend into debt crises without requiring debt restructuring from the other creditors. Um, the problem is it doesn't apply those systematically and it hasn't been applying, um, it hasn't been applying those systematically in relation to the COVID response. But the IMF itself has considerable power actually to enforce participation of private creditors and to, you know, facilitate debt restructurings. Um, but, but yeah, I, I guess I would agree there about the centrality of the US government in all of this. Like we are seeing this kind of deadlock at the moment where, um, China, uh, China has carried a lot of the weight, actually, in terms of the suspension of bilateral debt payments, um, but is not is now not going to move further unless um, some weight is now carried by the World Bank and IMF in terms of cancellation of payments to them. And, and to unlock that, of course, we need the US government to come on side and take some responsibility for this. So, so unfortunately, I, do, I think it's quite limited, um, you know, what a country like Germany can achieve. I, you know, it would be fantastic <laughs> if Germany was in charge of all of this, but unfortunately, it's not. Maybe can I come in so, uh, for a second? Yeah, come in, please. Um, just briefly, also on, on the role of of Germany, because I found this quite interesting when I came back. Um, and to give you some background, I mean, I never worked in Germany um, for my entire life. I left when I was 16 and then only started here two years ago. So I got to know Germany as kind of a foreign actor in the developing countries um, and then saw the government here from inside. And it's quite interesting because the German government has a lot of capacity to do things very well. It's very structured. It's amazing what you can do in a COVID crisis. Um, it really doesn't appear like that always abroad. Um, I mean, in, in Liberia, for instance, Germany was not the first country to, I don't know, meet a new minister, understand what the political economy was in the country. I think the Swiss were first. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure, independent of, you know, what's currently happening here and our electoral cycle, whether in, in such a situation, which is a lot about international politics and, you know, developing countries' politics, um, a country that doesn't really have such a big tradition of being so present and as political as countries like the UK, the US, or also France, who do get very involved, um, whether, whether one can do that. I mean, maybe I'm underestimating, um, ourselves, um, but, that, that seems a very new kind of territory. And we are normally not the leaders. We look to the IMF and to the World Bank to give us suggestions. Um, then we look at what G7, G20 are doing, and then we kind of try and form an opinion. We are normally not the ones who, who come up with a solution and then put everybody else on board. Great. I mean, weaving in a couple of questions from the audience, um, there's been, um, I think it was, it was uh, Greg Smith or Robert Owen mentioning that our discussion has been very normative in the sense that, you know, what should happen? Um, can you give us an idea what you think what will actually happen and what is the outlook? Uh, what events, what's the timeline, what events could possibly trigger um, you know, new developments in the future. So what is like, if all of this is probably impossible in the near term, what are we looking at over the next year or two? All right. I think what will happen, um, I think we will have more sovereign defaults. Uh, Zambia that just went into default, uh, more countries will, will, uh, go over the precipice and what we will see is the attempt to do their restructurings country by country, debt instrument by debt instrument, and that will take a long time. Even in the best of scenarios, that's very difficult to do and takes a lot of time, but usually we, we have some time, uh, but in the lat context of the Latin American debt crisis, this produced the what is called in the literature the lost decade, uh, basically a decade 
uh, high unemployment, uh, high mortality, infant mortality. I mean, the, the parade of horribles is truly uh, horrible from a protracted global debt crisis. So I think that's what will happen because we're not going to have uh, international leadership on this. But I want to be wrong. I, I, I would love it if uh, Philippa's optimism, I'm not sure it was optimism, but she was saying, you know, she hoped that the, the fund on its own would take the leadership role. That would be fantastic. I don't think that they're used to doing that either. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, what will happen is business as usual. We will muddle through really slowly. And it will cost us all a lot. Let me, let me, for the, we're actually getting to the end. So I wanted to ask you all sort of for a final statement and maybe weave in an answer to a question that I think is, is sort of hovering above this whole discussion. Um, how do you think, and, and, and Richard just brought it on, on the, the Q&A as well. How do we think about or how would you, your experience and, and your expertise in this field, how do you think about sort of the global financial system and how it serves developing countries? Should there, should we rethink um, the benefits also from an economic point of view, being at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, how much uh, foreign borrowing is a boon for development, uh, given the regular problems we incur so i don't i don't want you to probably there's it's a complex question but i would be interested how you feel about um the the rhetoric and the reality of the benefits of global finance and open capital markets for developmental purposes <laughs> and in any order you would like to go uh, we have we have a couple of five minutes left so you could um just like uh, sarah please um, I think that's a really interesting question. I think our our view really is that the global finance system currently just serves to extract wealth from developing countries and to perpetuate global inequality. Um, and actually, the the importance of private finance markets to development is um, seriously exaggerated. There are there are many low income countries which have not borrowed in foreign currency bonds in recent years. Um, or, and borrowed, you know, very little from the private sector. And some have got really impressive records, um, both in terms of keeping their debt payments under control while also having strong economic growth and, you know, increasing public spending. So we did some research, um, uh, on this and countries like Burkina Faso, Cambodia, Madagascar, Nicaragua, Nepal, they're all countries which have kept their debt payments low, but have had consistently rising public spending per person. Um, that, so there does seem to be actually this correlation between um, uh, having a lot of private external debt and um, uh, having to cut your public spending. Um, and obviously that relationship is a complex one. Um, it's often because countries borrow from the international finance markets once they've used up all of the bilateral debt and multilateral debt that they can get their hands on. But we still do think actually that the, the importance of that private finance, which often tends to be the most expensive, is, is really over-egged. Um, and I, maybe I'll just make one sort of final closing point, just um, because of the, I would 100% agree with Muti's analysis of the, the likely scenario. I think the factor that um, uh, maybe we haven't talked about in this discussion is the extent to which civil society in developing countries are really like uh, mobilizing now on this issue. A lot of the, a lot of civil society organizations, um, in the countries which had a debt crisis in the 80s and 90s, you know, had moved on to other issues because those debt crises has been resolved and a pivot has been having to, to happen over the last, you know, year or two. Um, but a lot of civil society organizations now are really mobilizing, starting to pay attention to organize regionally in Africa and Latin America and otherwise. Um, and I think hopefully we'll start to see the impact of that strength in global debt movement on, uh, the position of countries themselves and also the positions of the, the creditor countries. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Philippa, me too. We have a minute each maybe for um, uh, wrapping up 
you I'll give my minute and your position yeah start please I'll give my minute to Philippa I I don't have any more bottom line uh uh thoughts and Philippa is the the real economist and real expert I'm a fake economist and so now I have to do as well as you that's a lot of pressure I'll try and say something sensible I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding um about what financial markets are good for and what governments or the public sector can do well and can't do well. So we just don't need the private market for the provision of liquidity, which is essentially, you know, what you do when you lend money to money to countries. Um you need the private sector to select or differentiate a good from a bad investment project. In the case of lending money to developing countries, the private sector isn't doing this because they basically look at IMF DSAs. It's hilarious. I mean, when you talk to to bank analysts, um, what they do is they read IMF stuff all day long. So there's no value add from this, um, and there's ample liquidity in developed markets. So I think there's been an over reliance on private actors for no good reason. And I mean, basically, you get what you ask for. I worked at the World Bank 2013 to 15 and all we're pushing was private finance. Now we have it. Now we have all the private actors who don't want to give in, who go and sue you, but yes, that's exactly what you get when you have the private market. So, yes, I think we should roll that back. I think there should be a larger role for the public sector um because there's a real issue with with hot money flows from private markets that have nothing to do with anything that makes sense and now I'll shut up. Well thank you very much uh, Philippa Sarah me too thanks so much I learned a lot um and this thanks to everyone for for joining us today this wraps up to this year's uh, debt talks on INET to watch any of the previous events and this event obviously please visit the INET YouTube channel linked to the right of your video player and remains to say from my side everyone has a wonderful and safe rest of 2020 and let's hope that 2021 will be a better year for everyone thank you so much bye bye